put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. If the video is simply too long for you, I did record a shorter version and the link is in the description box. Noah 3D Mood Review. Jennifer Connelly tries her best to be a supporting wife as she watches her husband, Russell Crowe, devote himself entirely to what to others appears to be the work of a madman. But enough about Beautiful Mind. Noah is greeted a, an omen by God, and he, he, he is determined to follow it. He is building an ark and, you know, taking in all the animals, two of every kind. You know more or less the story until the point where you don't, because this is kind of an update, a different interpretation of the, the Bible story. The, the, the king of the land is not happy with the whole <laughs> only animals and Noah's family on the ark thing. He wants in as well, and he wants to bring his army. And I suppose that's about what I should say about that for now. And Noah and his family do get some unexpected help in their endeavors. Now, I should address the elephant in the room immediately for those who are already familiar with my stance on religion. If we're talking yes, no, am I an atheist? Yes, I am an atheist. I do not consider that particularly to be something that drives me as much as just my desire to be rational, to, to take in all the evidence regardless of the situation. And I prefer a religious man who you know, is, a, you know, a good person and helps his fellow man than, you know, someone who isn't religious but, you know, is a jerk. So, I, yes, I, I will not be, I'm, I'm not doing this review in order to kind of you know, patronize the the Christians, or for that matter, the Jews, or the Muslims, who also value the story of Noah greatly. Also, I will not be engaging in any discussion on this video, in the comment section, regarding the legitimacy or morality of religion, any religion whatsoever. You can bring something like that up if it leads into an argument about the movie. Now, I suppose a good place to start is, am I not entertained? And yes, frankly, this really grabbed me right from the start. It's, I mean, I, I pretty much figured this, I did for a while consider not watching this movie, but it would be the first Aronofsky movie that I did not watch. And then, you know, when I heard that it got 3D showing, obviously I'm not going to pass that. If you ever watch this, do it in 3D. It is amazing. 3D and surround sound is that this movie is 
part of the atmosphere is crafted around that. There are times where you hear a, like, you hear a bird, and it's like you're hearing, you're hearing it behind you, and you're not seeing it yet, neither are the characters, and then when it moves into the shot, you know, it's, excuse me, I had a lot of candy. Yeah, it, it really works impeccably well, and the way things kind of, the, the movie never really throws anything directly at the screen, but it kind of sticks out, there's depth to it all over, and some of the shots in this are just amazing in 3D. Just, this, this is a movie you almost might want to watch just for the visuals, but there's plenty more to it than that. Just to continue on the visuals, there are some really nice thematic recurring images and the like. There is, we see Cain killing Abel, and we see this in silhouette. There's, there's some great use, as usual. Aronofsky, Aronofsky and visuals are just amazing, of course. And he makes great use of different, you know, the way he uses silhouettes and, what's it called, time-lapse sequences in this is breathtaking. Anyway, Cain and Abel shown in silhouette and there is this one sequence where it kind of takes that silhouette and for every frame that it moves, or every couple of frames, just long enough for us to perceive what it is, we're seeing it's, it's a Roman centurion with a sword. No, it's a soldier from World War I with a, you know, bayonet on his rifle. And it just, it speaks volumes. It says so much in those few frames. And just, yeah. And, and the time lapse, I mean, there is a sequence in this. I mean, we know the, the, the Genesis story. We know the story of the, the seven-day creation of Earth. This puts visuals to that. Like, literally, it is Russell Crowe reading the story aloud, and we're getting visuals, and it is just... I mean, okay, recently, there was, like, talk about, oh, creationists should get equal time on Cosmos. You know what? Just grab that part of this movie and air it, you know, as, as part of Cosmos or whatever. Honestly, I'd say that that, because it is breathtaking in this. It, it really, and just, and, and it really, you, you see the growth, you see the change. And on that, you know, the first day, you see our world, Earth, being created. And you see star system and just, you know... Yeah, things in space. I'm not really yet. I, I don't really know the term, especially not in English. So, but yeah, it's just, it's beautifully done. And I suppose that more or less covers the visuals. But yeah, that does segue nicely into just overall production values. Really, there hasn't been a big, well-made, epic, live-action Bible story since the Ten Commandments from 1956, which is a great movie, and I say that as I, I was never raised to be religious. I have never believed. I watched that movie, I've watched it, I don't know how many times over the years. First watched it when I was a kid. Fantastic movie. I just, regardless of what you believe or don't, that movie is well made, and so is this one. Anyway, yeah, since that one, there hasn't really been one, and yeah, so now we get another one, and this is of course a very different movie, because it is, Aronofsky is a 
self-professed atheist, and he calls this the least biblical Bible film ever made. And there is some truth to that, although I heard someone say that like God and faith is like mentioned once in this. I don't know. There, there are a ton of references to. I mean, they don't say like God or they, they don't say God or Yahweh. They say Creator. That's still. I mean, there, there are constant references to that. I, I don't know what it is people have been looking for there. I don't think they would really have name dropped it from, from what I understand, and I'll grant you that this is mostly from Life of Brian, saying the name would actually get you stoned, and not the fun kind of way, which is now legal in several states. Anyway, yeah, so... This is a movie that could only really have been made... That, that could not have been made until very recently, because it does take liberties. It doesn't follow the story to the letter. It's not a literalist interpretation the way the 56 film is. And this, by the way, is also the first theatrical, big-budget Noah. The, the others are mostly just these animated shorts. And that does also point towards some, a, a bit of a theme. There is not necessarily a huge amount of story here. The Ten Commandments, there's a ton of stuff there. I'm not gonna go over it just in case you have absolutely no idea about the story, but yeah, there's plenty of story there. You, you know how they actually filled up all that running time there. They had to cut stuff in that one. In this, to get it to, I mean, this movie is like two hours and twelve minutes or so before the end credits start, and yeah, there's plot all the way, and in order to accomplish that, yes, they had to add some stuff. They, they did add some stuff, and yeah, there are things that are differently interpreted than many might. Now, yes, with it being Aronofsky, I mean, it has the production values you would expect from Aronofsky. You know, we've got Clint Mansell's excellent scoring. You know, we've got the, you know, amazing acting, spot on casting, beautiful cinematography. I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm pretty much done with the visuals, I promise. And just, and truly powerful drama, you know, I, I I haven't seen a bad movie by him yet, I, and I, trust me, I have been looking, I, I try to be extremely critical of the, and, and I always say there's at least one bad, you know, everyone's entitled to make at least one mistake, at least one bad movie or video game, but he hasn't made one yet that I, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to claim that I understand what The Fountain was about, was really about, but it didn't... Yeah. I think I'm just going to leave that there. Yeah. So, yeah, it just... Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of talent here. So obviously, anything that could go wrong here is that some of that was misapplied. You know, no one's going to come out of this movie and say that the effects weren't good, because they're excellent. This is like the most, not like, this is the most complicated render of the ILM Studio to date. So, just throwing that out there. What people might complain about is the interpretations and the creative decisions. And some have pointed to the the fights and the battle scenes as you know that they really shouldn't be here. That that the story of Noah doesn't really you know, how how do you fit that in or should you even fit that in? And I can I can see where they're coming from, and it's maybe not the the best moments of it. But again, it is kind of a I don't 
don't think that the movie would have worked quite as well if there hadn't been such a tangible conflict. Like I said, the literally the, the king, Ray Winstone, shows up and he's like, you're going to need a bigger boat because we're going to be on it before you leave. And, and I'm serious about that. And... Yeah, that's, you know, I haven't really heard any other interpretation of the Noah story that included such a detail, but if you don't have that, it's, there's not, it's not quite, it doesn't really need to be put on the big screen if there isn't a, a big, tangible drama. And I would say that it doesn't, invent new things, it's more that this king is, he is the embodiment of the wickedness of man that God is seeking to eradicate with the Great Flood. And really, that in general, most of the major characters in this represent something of human beings, some, some, you know, well-known trait. Noah and his family and then this king, yeah, very much, and, and it has you reflecting on the nature of humanity. Also because these characters, the way they behave in different situations, the, yeah, the, their, excuse me, their growth and development, excuse me, where they start, where they end up, this, excuse me, very much, yeah, it, it leaves you, it, it leaves you with a lot of food for thought, which, again, is usually what Aronofsky does. Now, the, yes, so, a, Let's see, other complaints that have been made. Some have said that this is too humorless and too drawn out. And I do think there, there are just enough light moments, such as when... <sighs> okay, I'm going to expand upon this, but there's a rock creature that's playing tag with a young girl. And that in itself, you, yeah, that's obviously not something you can take particularly seriously. That, that is clearly made to, you know, that's a little glimmer of light. But there are just enough of these little light moments that you realize just how dark this film is. And it really could have used a lot more of this. And it is really the only Aronofsky film that is that just, I don't know, it's, it might also be that it doesn't quite have the forward momentum of something like Pi, you know, where it's just rushing ahead constantly, driven by this. I mean, for, for how much this is potentially about Noah the Madman, this is you know, yeah, it, it does kind of take its sweet time at points. And I think that was more or less the various... Yeah, so... Yes, to get into the, the rock people, basically there are fallen angels in this. They're known as Watchers. And basically, and this is explained very early on, they, when they were angels, they were beings of pure light. And they looked somewhat like what we would think angels look like. And at the same time, they're a little undefined. They're kind of, you know, you don't get a really clear look at them, as you shouldn't. And 
when they defied the Lord and came to earth because they had mercy for man for men, they basically their form of light started sticking to things of, of earth. So mud and rocks became part of their body. You know, when they touched them it would and now when we see them they are these six armed rock people and the only thing that's left of the light is this kind of line and then where their you know their eyes are. And it's basically that there is hole in the rock that leads into the light. And yeah, these watchers play a role in you know they yeah. That's that's how I'm gonna leave that. Now there is a yeah something that some have pointed out, and this is very much true. This is a aggressively green movie. It is very much like that. The king that I mentioned, he's a miner, and and not in the you know yeah they look about twelve thirteen. No, the the digging stuff up out of the ground kind of miner, and basically. Him and his ilk have, you know, left the earth dry. Like, we are talking, you know, Scar taking over Pride Mountain. Yeah. It's, it still does make more sense here than Lion King, though, because how on earth would lions cause a drought? Anyway. Yeah, it's... And on the other hand, we have Noah, who is seen tending to wounded animals. And I'm pretty sure him and his family are like vegan. It's, it's like said, you know, they're almost immediately when we meet Noah, there's like, you know, an animal dying. It's like, why, why did they hunt this? Uh, they eat it. Wow. You know, I don't even know what's going on with them. You know, yeah, so... Just, yeah, keep that in mind. They're, you know, don't... Uh, well, vegan, I guess possibly just ve vegetarian. Anyway, they do not eat meat, at least. And, yeah. I can completely understand those who feel that this was too on the nose. It's not subtle at all. It is, it's... yeah. Now... I think that about covers it for that. Something I quite liked about this was that it... it made efforts to explain things that might otherwise seem strange, like logistics. We we see how the animals are drawn towards the or we we get a pretty good idea of how they could find their way there to to the ark. We are told Yeah, we're we're told some of the logistics of the operation, basically. This is very gritty. The yeah, so some have described it as a grand story on a very personal level, and that's very much true. Every step of the way, we're right there with Noah and his family, and you know you can practically feel the blood and sweat. There is no, you know, the 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 makeup is all done to look natural, rather than to you know. If you've seen 10,000 BC, you can, you know that movies set thousands of years ago don't necessarily take care to make the women actually look natural. They might, you know, make them, you know, put makeup on them still. Here that isn't the case. They look very natural. 
Now, and yeah, I mean, I could go into detail about the the actors. I'd more or less be talking about all of them. I uh, excuse me, excuse me. They're they're all great. Russell Crowe is really solid as he has a lot of different. He, he hits the entire spectrum of moods, and he really hits the nail on the head. You believe him every step of the way. Now, I suppose... This is actually, this is Aronofsky's first film in 3D, so yeah, he did amazing on that. This was, let's see, this was also written by Aronofsky with, who, who wrote Pi, Requiem for a Dream in the Fountain, and he also co-wrote it with, don't remember the full name, but something Handel, who co-wrote The Fountain, The Fountain Store, the story of The Fountain, with him. Now, the this has some great universal values. It's there is this like I've already mentioned that some of the some of the characters you know reflect different aspects of humanity and. Yeah, I... Ham, I believe it is, is kind of, throughout the film, struggling with the idea of what is, what is it to be a man, as opposed to a boy? What is it to be grown up? And, yeah, they, they do some great stuff with that. There's, like I said, there's a lot of recurring recurring images and concepts, and the, yeah, the, another recurring image that's used really well, and I'm really going to try to make this the last of the visual stuff, you see the snake from the Garden of Eden multiple times, and it is very clear, I mean, it, you know, it always symbolizes this sort of, the, the, The inherent wickedness of man, the, the the inherent sinful nature of man, and yeah, it's just it's used really well at just the right time times. Now I the best parts of this, as others have also noted, is when it is a character study of Noah. That is, that's some of the most compelling drama. There's some great drama in just the family, and I won't give away how or where that comes from. Now, I will say that I don't think that the... If you aren't, if you don't adhere to a literalist interpretation of the Bible, then I don't think that this movie really w will bother you too much. It does, it adds and changes things, but the inherent, the, the overall moral of the story is very much intact and in fact brought you know, fleshed out by the changes. It's, yeah, it, it is very much about, you know, getting rid of the wicked and finding a way to start over. You know, not letting, yeah, it's, it's not, 
it's not the ultimate ending, it is a new beginning. Now, the... I suppose that more or less covers it. I will say that it does, you know, f the green message, it does, it's very consistent with that, at least. It's, it's kind of Avatar at points, like nature gives them everything they could need. There's, yeah. Now. This does go into Noah's survivor's guilt, which is something that Aronofsky has been fascinated by from, from childhood. The, the character of Noah, who we saw as a dark, complex character suffering from real survivor's guilt. And that very much comes forth here. Now, this is... A, and, and this does do a very credible job of exploring that survivor's guilt. And again, we're, we're not necessarily in agreement with Noah, but we can understand everything he does, and we believe that he means what he says. So, yeah. And it is... It is made to be inten intentionally ambiguous where, where the, the setting in time, it could be a thousand years ago or a thousand years from now. Again, whilst it, of course, is at least on the surface a Bible story. Now, I think that... But, but yes, it does very much have the, the, the themes of good, you know, good conquering evil and, you know, love and obedience, what it means to be an adult, you know, kind of our role in creation. And yes, I will say it is it is sometimes suspenseful and often very tense. And again, I in part the the very tangible you know physical conflict that this film brings into it. In, f in fact, throughout the film, there is this... Noah and his family kind of live off, you know, in the woods by themselves. And at first, no one really knows they're there, that kind of thing. And once other people come into it, it's, you know, it's dangerous. So, that's... yeah, but... Yeah, a ton of tension comes from that, and while I can understand, you know, it being kind of, yeah, it is perhaps a bit dragging at points, I personally was never bored. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.